Hey, what's going on, Shrimp Keepers? So uh, today is Sunday. Uh, I want to do something a little special, a little different uh, for you all. I want to do a talk specifically today on how to breed shrimp. Um, and mainly we're going to focus on Neocaridina and, uh, and also tiger shrimp because the two go kind of hand in hand. And so we're going to cruise on through it. Um, I'm probably going to talk for about 45 minutes to an hour and give you everything from types of shrimp to um, how big of a setup, um, you know, how to take care of them, water changes, food type, a little bit of everything. We're just going to go straight through it. And shout out to everyone in the house right now. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being a part of the live stream. Um, hopefully it's working good for you. We have some awesome people in the house. We got V Stag here. Oh, let me... Let me mute myself. So anyway, yeah, so we're going to get right into it. We're going to start talking about everything that comes down to breeding shrimp, uh, specifically the Neocaridina. So uh, shout out to everyone. We got Kyle's fish room. He's driving home. He, he picked up a huge order today. Uh, thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, we got Stormy, Nisi. We got Ollie Taylor. Ollie, I got to get back to you, man. We got a conversation we got to do. Um, but thank you all for being here. And uh, hopefully I'm going to give you a ton of information today and uh, really get your guys' mind spinning as far as breeding shrimp and keeping them in a freshwater aquarium. And so we're going to get into Neocaridinas, and this is really to help kick off the shrimp breeding competition that we're hosting, uh, which is going to be coming up here this week for sure, 100%. And so, yeah, so we got a lot of cool stuff going on. So anyway, let's get right into it. Um, we're going to talk about how to breed freshwater shrimp. So just a little bit about me. Um, I began in the hobby in about 2010. Uh, if you guys didn't know this, I started off with aquatic plants. That was my first passion, uh, first thing ever. And so I started off with a 55 gallon tank that was given to me. And it's really cool what happened. Um, it was an ex-girlfriend's dad that gave me the fish tank and I got into guppy grass. And I remember like trimming the guppy grass back and every, what, every two weeks I'd have to trim it back. And what would happen was I would have so much of it, I would just throw it away, right? And I didn't know about Aquabid. I didn't know about selling um, aquatic plants, nothing like that. So I, I saw a video on YouTube by GM Love 9 um, the first YouTuber that I started watching. He doesn't really make videos anymore, but he did a tutorial on how to ship uh, fish. And I'm like, man, if this 15-year-old kid can ship fish, like, uh, a guy like me going to school for business and accounting can obviously, you know, figure this thing out. So I did my research. I figured out how to ship aquatic plants. I posted my first ever auction on Aquabid uh, for guppy grass. And I remember it sold for $54. Like ridiculous. Like guppy grass doesn't go for that much. I mean, it was a huge portion, but $54. And then I started thinking, I'm like, man, like who in the world would pay for something like this? And now here I am you know, 2010, that's seven years later, like I'm the guy that would pay for that. And so that's kind of how it all started. The shrimp lights just came on. So that'll give you guys something to look at. But anyways, yeah. So I started in aquatic plants, um, a little bit of background about me. And again, I have a PowerPoint in front of me. This is what I use at most of the clubs. And so I'll refer to it a little bit, just kind of keep me on point. Um, but a little bit about my background, I majored in business accounting in college. Um, I started Flip Aquatics in 2014. Kind of how I started Flip Aquatics was, um, shout out to Frank Tank's Bulls, uh, drop in the Super Chat. Put towards the camera for your videos. I have so many baby shrimp. Thank you so much. I'll get to all the Super Chats once we get through the PowerPoint, once I get through all the topics I want to hit on. But thank you so much for the Super Chat. I really do appreciate that. But yeah, so I, I majored in business accounting in college. Uh, I got a degree in both of them. I started working for a doctor. Um, the doctor was really, really great, you know, right up my alley, just an awesome person to work for. Um, there, there turned out to be some promises that just didn't work out, um, broken promises, um, misrepresentations. Like I just got misled a lot and it eventually got to the point where I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to kind of back away from this. I'm going to do my own thing. And that's where I'm like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to do flip aquatics. Like this is what I want to do for a living. This is the business that I want to have. And so I started flip aquatics and it was just all steam ahead after that. I spent about, I want to say three or four months, maybe not that long, maybe two to three months building a business plan. 
and really just investing time into it, uh, researching what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, um, what are some areas that I could save time in, like water changes and things like that. So the whole course of Flip Aquatics, um, <laughs> the whole course of Flip Aquatics is to sell freshwater shrimp. Um, we're doing snails. We're doing shrimp-related products. We're moving into micro fish. Um, we're doing a little bit of everything for nano aquariums. And so in 2000, in, in December of 2015, we eventually launched Flip Aquatics. And so um, a little bit about how the business all kind of sparked off and how it all got started is I started a YouTube channel. Go figure. You guys are watching me on YouTube right now. So in 2012, I began making videos uh, for YouTube. It was just kind of something I wanted to do for fun. It was a good way for me to look back and kind of see where I came from, you know, maybe two years down the road and just kind of keep track of my journey. And I really just did it for uh, the passion of it, the fun of it. Again, that's five years ago now. And it kind of all just blew up from there. So I got into shrimp just on a on like this crazy story, uh, my neighbor wanted to feed shrimp to his alligator, a uh, ghost shrimp, and it was costing him all this money. And he's like, man, if you could breed shrimp, I would buy them off you and pay you for them if I could feed them to my alligator. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I'll definitely do that. And it turned out that I started watching the shrimp more than I watched any of my other fish tanks. And so shrimp became my passion and you guys really encouraged me to do that. So Currently, I'm close to 15,000 subscribers, you know, close to 2 million video views. Um, just the love and the support is just everything to me. You know, you guys really encourage me and, uh, and push me. And, and when I need to pick me up, you guys pick me up. And, and when you guys need to pick me up, you, you know, you guys, I, I'm always here for you. And the other thing about YouTube for me is transparency. So like in everything we do, I, I film it all. Like you guys got to see my import order and see how it went. You got to see everything that we've ever done. You got to see the fish room builds. You know, you guys know so much about my business and that's what really helps Flip Aquatics because there's so much transparency. Like you guys can go in there and see the shrimp for yourselves in a video and know the amount of work that went into it. Um, you know, treating parasites. You guys have seen me do that. You, you've seen us breed them. So you guys know exactly what you're getting and so that's the whole point and that's where youtube has helped us so much because it just creates transparency through an entire business opposed to just having a business and and trying to convince people to buy from you right and so a little bit about flip aquatics so when when i started flip aquatics it was all about usa bread shrimp you know i wanted to provide shrimp that were parasite free uh, they were healthy they were used to united states water um you know and really, really help grow the hobby here in the United States. But what I really figured out is that I could not keep up with the demand. There's no way. Like I was constantly sold out. I never had enough shrimp. I couldn't breed them quick enough. And, and that's an awesome problem to have. I'd much rather have not enough shrimp than way too many that I don't know what to do with. And so you guys have been awesome in that aspect. But through the course of keeping the shrimp, I realized that if I'm not selling healthy shrimp, then you guys have to go somewhere else to buy them. So you're often going to, um, you know, importers that don't really care about the shrimp. They're just trying to make money or, or people that, you know, aren't, you know, aren't treating for parasites. They're not really looking for disease. And so it happened that so many people were buying from people that didn't care about the shrimp and the shrimp were doing poorly. They were dying and people were leaving the hobby. And so I thought if I can't provide USA bread shrimp, I might as well provide healthy imported shrimp. And so that's where I started getting into importing and quarantining and getting rid of uh, diseases and all that. And so that's kind of the strive that I went towards. And, and the whole business, like the YouTube channel and my business, all we want to do, all I want to do is grow the hobby because it's a hobby that I found passionate in and a hobby that is really important to me. And it's just something that I really, really care about. So I want to really provide healthy shrimp for you all. And so that's a little bit about Flip Aquatics. And again, guys, I'm really not answering questions yet. And I apologize for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do this whole presentation. I'm going to talk to you guys about breeding shrimp, uh, kind of go through the basics of everything. And then right at the end of the presentation, you guys are more than welcome to write down questions. We can go back and, and talk about certain things. And, uh, and I would love to answer every question that you guys have. But thank you all for being here again. And, uh, and so where did it all begin? Like, I started a business, you know, but where was the first step? And so in 2014, 
Uh, my buddy Mitchell Chaster, shout out to him. Uh, we went to the Petco dollar per gallon sale, and I'm like, listen, I need to buy some tanks. And they're like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, I need a special order then. And they're like, well, we can do that. And I'm like, I want 40, 40 gallon longs, and I think I got 20, 20 gallon breeders. I'd have to look back in the video. And they're like, what are you going to do with all these tanks? I'm like, I'm breeding shrimp. Like, that is what I'm doing. And so for me, I went and bought the tanks because of, I knew if I had the tanks, like, guaranteed that I'm going to do this. And so we literally took his Mitchell, we took his, his uh, truck, which has a little six foot bed and we stacked 16 40 gallon breeders in it. We had one ratchet strap. Like they were just saran wrap. Like it was the most dangerous thing ever. We had to drive 45 minutes home. It took us like an hour and a half. Like it was just insane, but that's kind of where it all started. And it was just, it's been a journey ever since. So currently we have a shrimp room. Um, we have about 156 tanks going. Uh, 90% or somewhere around there are dedicated to shrimp. Uh, we do have some fish and, and we do have some empty tanks as well. And so we're really striving to get um, all of our tanks filled. And it's just been, it's been quite the journey. We're building a new shrimp room. Uh, we're going to do some ponds. Like it's just so many new things are coming along. And so it's, it's just awesome. Like it's amazing the journey that we've been on and to have you guys come along on that journey has just been a true blessing. And so some of the shrimp that we sell the most of um, are definitely Royal Blues and Crystal Reds. Now, both of which were sold out of, but those are the two shrimp that really helped us get going. Um, a cool story about Royal Blue Tigers is it's, it's a beautiful shrimp that we are really well known for. Um, we sold them all across the country. They're just an awesome, awesome shrimp. But my wife, Amanda, if you guys know her, uh, she's this beautiful woman, like just an amazing woman inside and out. And I actually met her through having Royal Blues. So this is a cool story. So she messaged me on my business Facebook page. Um, I got a message. And at first I look at it, I'm like, what? Like this, there's this hot, you know, 23-year-old girl messaging me about Royal Blues. I'm like, it's got to be a fake profile, right? And so we carry on this conversation. I go and check out her profile. And she's like a real person. Like, I'm like, this, this stuff doesn't happen, right? And so... We messaged for about 30 minutes. I tell her to go check out one of my videos that I did on how to breed Royal Blue Tigers. And, uh, and then she could get, you know, an idea of how to do them there. And so she went and checked out the video and, and she said in her mind, she's like, wow, this guy sounds young. And so she like did some research and found out who I was, found my personal Facebook page. And then she messaged me on my personal Facebook page like a day or two later. And I'm like, man, this girl's kind of a stalker. Like what is going on here? Well, she was cute. So I'm not about to say anything. And so me and her talked and uh, we, we ended up messaging back and forth on Facebook. I kind of gave her the cold shoulder. Like, you know, I wasn't really interested. She lived in Indiana. I lived in Ohio. You know, there's like seven hour difference. And so like, what are the chances that me and this girl are going to date or something? So I kind of kept blowing her off and she just kept messaging me back and forth. And so we ended up like talking for like six months. And uh, there was a pet store out in Indiana that I wanted to go visit. Um, they wanted me to come out there and teach them a little bit about shrimp, talk about a wholesale account, things like that. And I went out there and I was like, hey, I'm going to be in your area on this date. I was like, would you want to meet up? And she's like, yeah, like I would love to meet up. You know, we can, you know, see each other, you know, get to know each other a little bit better. And this is like six months after talking for a while. And uh, so me and her met up and it's just been amazing ever since. And we ended up getting married like I think it was eight or nine months later. And now we've been married for eight or nine months. And it's just been quite quite the Cinderella story, I guess. I don't know, but it's just been awesome. So I always tell people, like, if, if my business fails and I end up not doing shrimp or something like that, at least it led me to a beautiful wife. And, uh, again, inside and out, she is just awesome. And so, yep, we uh, – <laughs> if YouTube did anything good for me, it got me a wonderful wife. Yeah, so that's always cool. But there's – so moving on, moving on, sorry. Uh, the two major genus of shrimp are your Neocaridina and Caridina. So ne Neocaridina are like your much easier to keep shrimp, whereas Caridina are generally a lot harder. Um, they require like buffered water usually, things like that. And so let's first talk about Neocaridina. We'll go over just some of the basic care, um, things like that. So Neocaridina, for the most part, they're they're very easy to breed. They come in like a multitude of colors. You get orange, you get red, you get blue, you get green, you know, you get orange, you get everything. And so a lot of the shrimp that you guys will probably see like at 
uh, fish auctions and things like that are going to be Neo Caradina. And uh, like your cherry shrimp, those are Neo Caradina. Uh, for the most part, shrimp, um, Neo Caradina, Neo Caradina do best in a pH higher than seven. Um, I would say anywhere between 6.8 to like eight, you can usually get away with. Um, they prefer harder water. So like um, if you're going by TDS, they prefer a TDS of about 200 or more. Um, a GH of like up to, you know, somewhere around like 10 to 15 is usually pretty good. Um, a KH of like five or six is usually pretty good. Um, as far as temperature, they prefer like 72 to 78 degrees, things like that. The price, they usually range in price anywhere between a dollar for like your, your low grade cherry shrimp up to like 10 to $15 for like the really high grade um, Neo Caradina. And so just a couple types of cherry or of Neo Caradina is you have your cherry shrimp, which are the ones you normally see. Um, you have, here, we'll go through them all. We got fire reds. And so cherry shrimp get a little confusing. There's, there's a grading scale. So you start off with cherry, then you go to Sakura, then you go to fire red, and then you go to painted fire red. And all of these shrimp, um, it's just like how thick the shell is in color, um, how translucent they are. And so like cherry shrimp is your lowest grade. Like they're usually pretty splotchy, maybe clear with a little bit of red. And so that's where you get your grading scale. If you have one that's like solid, beautiful red, then that's probably either a fire red or a painted fire red. All right. So I get this question all the time. Like, what is the difference between a Bloody Mary and a fire red or the Bloody Mary and a cherry shrimp? And it all comes down to their color. So cherry shrimp and Sakuras and fire reds and painted fire reds, it's all their shell that's the color. So the highest grade cherry shrimp, like you can't see through the shrimp. Uh, with Bloody Marys, they have like a translucent shell. And so it's really the pigment of their skin that's the red color. And so they are like absolutely stunning, the Bloody Marys. Like by far my favorite red shrimp uh, for sure. So that's a Bloody Mary. And they say that Bloody Marys are bred from chocolate shrimp, um, which makes sense. Like a lot of different things are bred from chocolate shrimp. <laughs> really like a lot of your fantasy blues, things like that are, are bred from chocolate shrimp. You also have yellow shrimp, so like your neon yellows or uh, whatever people call them. They're just neo caradina yellows. They are the biggest pain in the butt in the world. I would never recommend breeding yellow neo caradina because they are, I mean, I have failed so many times trying to breed them. Like I used to breed them like a long time ago when I first was getting into shrimp. I had a 55 gallon. They went buck wild. Everything was great. Ever since then, I have not been able to breed them. Like something always goes wrong. They all die off. And uh, it's just <laughs> not good. Not good at all. But there are neon yellows. If you can get a good breeding group of yellow neo caradina shrimp, you're going to have, you're, you're going to make a fortune because you just don't see it very often. The next thing is an orange pumpkin or just an orange Sakura shrimp. Um, the oranges are fairly easy to keep. They're, they're absolutely beautiful in color. Um, they're one of my favorite shrimp. And uh, they just seem to do really, really well. They breed regularly. They pretty much breed all the time. So they're just... Awesome, awesome shrimp. Um, the next thing, so the blue neo caradinas, which are like your blue velvets, your blue pearls, blue dreams, fantasy blues, sapphire blues, like so many. Like blue neo caradina is probably the most like confusing thing in the shrimp hobby, and it's because like every importer names them something different. Like you know, you got blue jellies, but what's a blue jelly? You got blue velvets, but what is that? And it's just like. Uh, dream blue velvet like what the heck are those things and so it's so confusing and it all comes down to importers naming them something completely different just kind of putting their own spin on them um, or trying to change the name to sell them quicker or they're mixing like a blue velvet with a blue dream and you're getting all these funky colors and so I'm gonna try to make it really simple for you guys um, you got a blue velvet shrimp a blue velvet is bred from a cherry shrimp um, you go from cherry to um, to a red really then you get a little blue midsection which turns into a blue really and then you get rid of the red and then you have a blue velvet so that's how a blue velvet is created at least that is my um, opinion on it that's what i've seen through breeding them and mixing shrimp and all that kind of stuff so that is what a blue velvet is you also have a blue pearl which is a and it's kind of like own little category like a blue pearl and a snowball shrimp are pretty much kind of the same um, they come from the same family. So a blue pearl is something completely different. And then you have a blue dream. So a blue dream is usually um, the mixture between like a carbon shrimp, which is a black shrimp, and a blue velvet. And you kind of get like a blue dream out of those. 
Um, other blue dreams are bred from chocolate shrimp. And so there's a lot of confusion is that. So like whenever you get like a blue dream or a fantasy blue, do not mix it with other blues because you never know where the lineage led to and what you're going to get out of them. So if you take two nice blue shrimp, you're not always going to get a baby that looks really nice. Um, but if you buy from the same source and breed those, you're going to have a better chance of getting nice ones. And so then you move on to like a really shrimp. Like you have a carbon really, which is basically a really shrimp has a black head or a solid colored head, a solid colored tail, and a clear midsection. So that's what a really shrimp is. You have um, carbon reallys, which have a black head and a black tail and a clear midsection, or sometimes even blue carbon reallys, which have a blue midsection. And then you move on and you have like a red really, which has red head, red tail, clear midsection. And there's all kinds of them. They have yellow reallys. They have orange reallys. Um, I don't think they have green reallys yet, but that is something cool that somebody could start working on. I might have to start working on that. So yeah, so there are a ton of Neocaridina shrimps, so many options out there that you guys can go to. Now, as far as Caridina goes, um, so Caridina is a completely different genus. Uh, they can't interbreed with Neocaridina, so you can oftentimes keep the two together if you can find a good middle range. Um, but Caridina in general usually consists of more difficult shrimp. Um, you know, you have the Crystal Reds, you have the Taiwan Bees, you have Tiger Shrimp. Um, not all are super hard, but some are very hard. And they generally like a pH of, you know, down to 5.5 all the way up to 7. Um, tigers generally like a harder water, um, whereas other ones prefer like a really soft water. And so Caridina are your, your like advanced genus of shrimp more or less. Um, they're usually a lot more pricey. You know, I've seen some of them go for thousands of dollars. Um, but again, in general, they usually do best in a softer water. Um, their price range goes anywhere between, you know, $3 for the cheaper ones all the way up to thousands of dollars for the more expensive ones. And so it's just crazy, but we'll go through a couple types of um, Caridina. And again, guys, I'm not able to answer questions while, while we're doing the presentation side of it, but I definitely want to answer your questions at the end. I'll probably talk for um, 45 minutes-ish on, on breeding shrimp, and then we can go through some questions, and you guys can ask some great questions. And so if my mods in the house um, can take down really good questions and kind of shoot them back towards me, back at me towards the end, I would love to answer any question you guys have. So be writing them down, taking notes, and I would really appreciate that. And so as far as Caridina go, um, let's start with tiger shrimp. And tiger shrimp are the ones that you see most people keeping with Neo Caridina because they prefer a similar parameters. They like harder water. Um, they're not too keen on cage. You know, a little bit of cage is good. And so tiger shrimp are just your your ordinary tiger stripes. They they you know they're very pretty. They're wild caught. Um, they come from southern China, um, and then you know they come with super tigers, and then they they have like what's called a black tiger, which is like a solid black body, um, or it has irregular stripes. Like one of my favorite shrimp by far. Um, most of them nowadays have black eyes, and the black eyes come into play when you mix a black tiger with an orange eyed blue tiger or you just over interbreed it over many generations because usually an orange eye represents a blind shrimp. Um, so it's a shrimp that has very low vision. And so black tigers, again, are, are a very pretty one. And then you have like orange eyed blue tigers, which are like an amazing coloration, like absolutely amazing. Um, these ones still, you know, prefer the same parameters as, you know, your cherry shrimp and your other Neo Caridinas. And so, what they did is they mixed an orange-eyed blue tiger with a black tiger, and that's how they got the royal blue. And again, the royal blue is, is how I met my wife, so you know it's a good shrimp. And the royal blue is just a stunning shrimp. Um, again, they mixed orange-eyed blue tigers and black tigers back and forth, back and forth to get a nice solid blue color. And so you'll see some uh, royal blues that are actually solid black. And, you know, that's a black tiger, but they all are from the same type of shrimp. You know, it's all a mixed shrimp. And so that's how they created that. And then, so like the tiger shrimp, again, can be kept with Neocaridina. Um, generally, they require the same parameters, and they usually do pretty good together. Um, now you're moving on to like the crystal rules, which are your, your next step. Like uh, they're not beginner shrimp, but they're not super hard. They're like in the middle. You know, they're, they're something that, you know, most of you here today uh, could pull off. So the crystal reds are absolutely stunning. Um, and the crystal reds are really cool in the fact that they grade them so many different ways. And so it all comes down to color. Um, you know, are their legs colorful? Are they solid white? Are they solid red? They pay more for that. 
Um, can you see through their body or is their, their shell like a really, really nice color? And so that's one way to grade them. The other way to grade them is, you know, how intense um, is their color? Not how intense their color is, but like how much red do they have versus white? The more white they have, the higher the quality. Um, the more red they have, the lower the quality. And so it all comes back to, you know, how much red does it have and how nice is the color? So like a really, really, really nice crystal red is one that has a tiny little bit of red and a whole lot of white and just solid, beautiful color. You know, their legs are white or their legs are red. And that is a shrimp that is going to sell for a lot of money. And then you go into the crystal blacks and crystal blacks are the same exact way except they're black instead of red. So the less black they have, the higher the grade. And the more like solid the colors are, the better. You know, having black legs is like awesome. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into crystals, but the crystals usually require a softer pH than, or a softer water than, you know, your tigers. Um, you know, a pH of like 6.8 to 6.4 is usually pretty good. Um, I use fluval shrimp stratum for them. So they're really a great, great shrimp. And then you move on to like your Taiwan bees. And so your Taiwan bees include like blue bolts and wine reds and red pandas and black king kongs and like all these different things. And the cool thing about Taiwan bees is you can keep every different color variation of Taiwan bees in the same tank. And when they mix and interbreed and have babies, the babies aren't going to come out looking like some funky shrimp that's all mixed colors. They're going to come out either like a solid blue bolt or they're going to come out a solid uh, black panda or something like that. So the cool thing about them is you can have so many different colors in the same tank and get away with it without the risk of like, you know, jeopardizing the line. Now, some people breed only blue bolts in a tank and that's to get like the nicest blue bolts you can uh, while others, you know, just mix them together. So. I personally love the blue bolts or just the Taiwan bees in general uh, because they are so pretty and because, you know, they're just uh, like a harder to keep shrimp. So it's more of a challenge, but that's where it comes down to, you know, they are hard to keep. And so, you know, they're usually kind of pricey too. Um, this is really interesting. The original pair of black King Kongs sold for 10,000 us dollars to shrimp. Ten thousand dollars, like that is crazy. Now you can buy like black, not black king kongs, but you can buy like black pandas or close to black king kongs for like three or four bucks a piece. Like from some people. Now, granted, those are usually shrimp that are getting flipped pretty fast. Um, I think I sell them for like eight or ten dollars, something like that. And so, uh, oh man, we got we got Joey, the king of DIY, in the house. That is just crazy. Um, I got to stop the presentation to give some shout outs to the king of DIY. Um, Joey, thanks for, for stopping in and, and being a part of the live stream, man. Uh, it's an honor to have you in the house. So thank you so much for being here. And he said, Rob needs a shop back fund. <laughs> yeah. So I have, uh, I've overflowed a couple tanks in my time. Um, I just had a uh, recent disaster at the, the flip aquatics warehouse where a pump got loose and sprayed water everywhere. But yeah, so it's crazy that Joey's here. Thank you so much, man. I'm really proud of what you're doing for the hobby. And I uh, just love that you show for the hobby and, and what you're doing and the risks that you're taking. So much love to Joey. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows who Joey is, the king of DIY. But if you don't, go go show him some love. Um, support him for what he's doing. He is really putting, him up, putting himself out there for the hobby. And uh, he's been through some rough times like we all have. Um, you know, and he had a really heartfelt live stream not too long ago, just talking about the struggles that he went through. And so, um, so much love to Joey and what he's doing. So definitely go check him out, but that's just awesome. Thank you, Joey, for being here. And so, yeah, so that is Taiwan bees. I got a little off topic, but you know, you gotta, when you got a celebrity in the house, you, you kind of have to stop and, and give a shout out to them. So that's really cool. But, um, yeah, so moving on. Uh, a little bit about more into shrimp. So we saw the different categories of shrimp, you know, Neo Caridina, you got Caridina, Tigers, Crystals, Taiwan Bees, all the different stuff. And so now we get into how to sex shrimp. Like, you know, what's the difference between a female and a male? And uh, it's usually, it comes down to a lot of things. First of all, um, let me do this. So, all right. So first of all, how to sex shrimp. Uh, females are usually a lot bigger. Uh, they have vibrant colors. They really look great. They have what's called a skirt. 
And a skirt's like under their underbelly. And it's usually this rounded part. And that's to protect the eggs while they're holding them. And uh, so the cool thing about uh, females is they usually have a lot better color, right? And so I've seen this happen time and time again. Uh, people get cherry shrimp. They have some ones with really, really nice red color. And they go in and do what's called culling. And culling is where you take um, the ugly shrimp, right? And get them out of the tank so that you increase your line of shrimp. And so, so many times people go in and call their cherry shrimp colony and they'll take out all the ugly shrimp, which are the male shrimp, you know, the, the ugly ones, the small ones, the ones that don't have good color. And so they take all of the, the, the ugly males out and they go a couple months and they have no babies and they don't know why their big, nice red cherry shrimp aren't breeding. It's because they called out all the males. And so again, males don't have skirts. Um, they don't, they're usually much smaller. They have bad color generally. And so that's why when you import shrimp, they usually sell only females because females carry the best color. And so again, males have like this straight section under their underbelly, whereas females have a nice rounded belly. And if you can't tell with looking at their, you know, their skirt or their color or anything like that, another way you can tell if you have a female is they have what's called a saddle. So like right before they're getting ready to get pregnant or have eggs or anything like that, they have a saddle, which is like right on their back. It looks like a horse saddle. And it's when the, the eggs are moving down their back and going to their underbelly. And that's where they're going to hold them. And so we call that a saddle. And then also there's a berry shrimp, which is a shrimp that has eggs. And, uh, you know, it's got little eggs under its fanlets or whatever they're called. Um, they're swimmerettes, whatever people call them. I don't know the technical names, which I probably should. But anyway. They, they carry their eggs under their, their tail uh, for about 30 days. And so that's called a berry shrimp, um, most likely because the little eggs look like berries. And so those are a couple ways to tell if you have, um, you know, a female shrimp. And so now, now that you guys kind of understand the different types of shrimp, neocaridina versus caridina and all that good stuff, what is the right setup for breeding neocaridinas? Like how big of a tank, you know, what do I have to have in it? Do I have to have heaters? Um, substrate, all that kind of stuff. And so the first thing is tank size. You know, what do you recommend for how big a tank should be? Um, the first thing that I always say is you want to have at least a 20 gallon. And the reason for that isn't because like, you know, a 20 gallon long um, or a 20 gallon, like you have to have that, but it's usually, it's a lot, lot, lot easier to maintain. So like the more water volume you have, you know, if you make a mistake, the less the mistake is going to play into effect. Where if you have like a five gallon tank, if you don't like constantly top that tank off from evaporation, the parameters are going to shift so much that it's going to stress the, stress the shrimp out and eventually they're going to die. And so a 20 gallon long usually gives you some room for air. It gives you the ability to make a few mistakes and, you know, not kill your shrimp off entirely. And so I always, always suggest... Um, going with at least a 20 gallon long. And that's just what I found is easy and works for my schedule because I know how busy I am. And so I don't want to be messing with, you know, a five gallon tank or even these tanks behind me. Like you can see, like there's, there's some evaporation here. There's some evaporation here. Um, there's some algae growth, which is good for shrimp. We'll get to that later, but yeah, it's just tough to keep up on water changes and, and evaporation, everything like that. So 20 gallons is always good. And real, real quick, we got another super chat. Rack Cross in the house, dropping a five dollar super chat. He said, "Hey y'all, first time newbie here, soaking it up. Thanks for sharing the great info, Rob. Thank you for being here, Rack. I really appreciate the super chat and uh, you being a part of this little live stream. And so, thank you, thank you, thank you. But yeah, so the right setup for Neo Caradina shrimp. Uh, the next thing is filtration. You know, what is the best filtration? You know, if I'm going to set up a tank, like what should I use? Where do I get it? All that kind of stuff. Um, the first thing is sponge filters. So uh, sponge filters are always a great option. Uh, you know, you got the API sponge filters. You got um, the sponge filters that hang on the side of the glass and have two little tubes on them. Um, now, those ones aren't really my favorite. Um, even the API sponge filters, it's not my my favorite option. We're actually getting ready to come out with a type of sponge filter that we'll be selling um, that hopefully it won't leach anything um, because usually with the API sponge filters, um, sometimes you get cracks on the bottom and it's just, it's something that it doesn't really cause problems, but it could. And so like, there's a lot of like questions and they get clogged up easy and they just don't work. And so sponge filters are okay, but not all the time. And the other thing that we found is a great 
like absolutely amazing sponge filter is the matten filters like it is just an awesome awesome filtration system and we actually sell these on our website and this isn't a sales pitch in any in any sense of the imagination there's also switch tropicals that sells them there's a lot of great places you can get our matten filters from but matten filters are so good for shrimp tanks for the fact that they they literally take up the whole side of the aquarium right and then there's a little lift tube that shoots water out of it you know it can be driven by a pump it can be driven by air um, but it's just an amazing filtration for the fact that it takes up a whole wall of the aquarium and that creates um, not only good flow throughout the aquarium, but it also creates a huge bed for shrimp to be feeding on um, constant food source, you know, great bacteria, um, just the service area that it takes up. And so Madden filters are by far the best way to go as far as filtering a shrimp tank. Um, now you can go to like mechanical filtration or like your, you know, your aqua clears, um, canister filters. But the only thing with that is like shrimp are going to get in there. They always find a way, you know, whether they're baby shrimp or adult shrimp. And so making them safe for shrimp is a little bit more difficult and it's more expensive, all that kind of stuff. So I always recommend, you know, use matte filters if you don't mind the look of them. Um, if you do mind the look of them, go with sponge filters. If you don't like those, then you can go to like your hang on the backs or you know other type of things from there so substrate what substrate should you use for your shrimp tank um, neocaridinas i always recommend pool filter sand it is by far the best cheapest sand that i've ever gotten my hands on you can buy it from um, i think lowe's and like home depot and those places sell it i personally never bought it there i always go to a spa slash pool supplier and get it from them um, they just, they always, um, have it. It's usually $10 for a 50 pound bag or something like that. So it's dirt cheap. It's really, really clean because it's for pool filters. And so that is my go-to substrate. Um, I usually keep about half an inch in the bottom. Now, if I'm doing plants, um, I might do a little bit more, um, to give the plants something to root into, but a half an inch is perfect. Um, and again, it's so, so, so cheap. Um, the other substrate that we've used for Neocaridina is fluval shrimp stratum um, again that is an amazing cheap substrate not really cheap but it's cheaper than most um, it's just it, i mean it's awesome like it fluval shrimp stratum is by far a favorite buffering substrate and it will bring the ph down to like 6.8 most shrimp neocaridinas will do really well in that um, even though i recommend it be above seven and the only reason i recommend fluval shrimp stratum for neocaridina is if you really want to get into plants um, it's a good nutrient-rich substrate that really works well. And so those are two substrates that I really, really like and I use often in my tanks. The next thing is heaters. Um, <laughs> should I use a heater? Should I not use a heater? You know, what should I do? Uh, Nisi, thank you so much for linking the filters. Um, if you guys are interested in the filters, uh, the Madden filters, Nisi just linked it in chat. You guys can go check that out. If you're watching the replay of this, I'll have some of the links down the bottom of products that I use and where I get them from and all that kind of stuff. But heaters, do I use a heater? Do I not use a heater? What should I do? Um, the short answer is no, do not use a heater. Um, shrimp, it all comes down to risk versus reward. So heaters go bad. We've all had a heater go bad at some point in our lives. Uh, even the most expensive heaters eventually go bad. And when they go bad, they do one of two things. They either stay on or they stay off. If they stay on, you lose everything. If they stay off, you have a chance that it won't kill everything, but it still is going to provide stress. And heaters also do this thing where like if the tank drops one degree or two degree, then it shoots up real quick back to where it was and then it drops and then it shoots up. And so you have these like big fluctuations of temperature, which stress shrimp out. Shrimp don't like huge changes in temperature quickly. You know, they don't mind um, dropping a few degrees over the course of an hour. And so, like, shrimp can survive anywhere between, you know, 45-degree water up to 80-degree water, no problem. And trust me, I know. I have shipped shrimp into, like, super cold areas. They've been stuck in the mail for a week. They get to the person, and they're all alive, or at least all, most are alive. And so... I always recommend leave your tank at room temperature. Um, as long as it's not like in the attic where temperatures change drastically. Um, if you're like on the first floor in the basement, like temperatures aren't going to change that quickly that it's going to hurt the shrimp. Um, especially if you have 20 gallons or more of water because it's not going to change as quickly. And so do I recommend heaters? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
And so that is basically the basics of having the right setup for aquarium shrimp, uh, at least Neocaridina. Now we're moving into like, what are the three keys to breeding shrimp? Like what should every tank have? Like three things that every tank should have in some aspect or another. And these are what I consider the three keys to success. The first one, obviously a hundred percent Java moss, any type of moss, you know, Christmas moss, flame moss, um, even some water tank. Moss is like a must have in a shrimp tank if you plan on breeding them. And the reason being is moss provides hiding areas. Um, it sucks up nitrates. You know, it does so much good for a tank. Uh, when baby shrimp are born, they can crawl in there. They can feel safe. Uh, when an adult shrimp molts, they can crawl in there and feel safe. Um, there's food source in there. Microorganisms thriving in there. Um, you know, any live plant benefits a tank by creating an ecosystem that processes nitrates and uh, just is really, really good or nitrates or what is that, whichever one it is, you know, it helps, you know, break down heavy metals in the water. It's just an awesome, awesome plant to have. And it does really well in low light. So you don't have to invest in like these heavy lights to, to be able to do it. Um, so that's my first thing that I recommend for all shrimp tanks. The next thing is leaves, leaf matter. So we personally use uh, Indian almond leaves, uh, which Indian almond leaves are like an awesome leaf. Um, they've actually done research on it. Uh, Catawba trees are Indian almond leaf trees or Indian almond trees. Um, they've done research to see like if there actually are antibiotics or antibacterial uh, characteristics in the leaf. And there's actually um, bacteria in there that fights off cancer and, and all these different things. Like it's just like I forget the research because I don't have it in front of me. But I remember reading this report on Indian anomalies. I think I have a video on it where it just breaks down all these things and how beneficial they are, um, not even to aquariums, but just to people in general. And so we personally use only Indian almond leaves uh, for the simple fact that we've always used them and they work. Um, now, people use oak leaves or mulberry leaves or, you know, any hardwood leaves. You know, they use a ton of different leaves that they just find in their backyard. Um, do some research before using them. You don't want to introduce something uh, toxic to your tank um, and also know how to treat leaves and, and other things for parasites. I believe you use white vinegar. Um, soak it in white vinegar, a water solution of white vinegar and water. Um, I forget the ratio. Maybe it's like one to 10, like a little dab of white vinegar and a cup of water. Soak them in there and it, it takes off the pesticides. But uh, yeah, so in it, the reason leaf matter is so important is one, the water which create which replicate the natural environment of where shrimp come from, which are rivers and, and streams going through forests. Like that's where these shrimp are coming from. So there's constantly leaves in the water. There's driftwood in the water. There's all this stuff in the water. So cre recreating that environment is only going to lead you to, to success. And leaves also break down. Uh, microorganisms in the water break the leaves down and shrimp eat the microorganisms. Uh, they do eat some of the leaf. And so all these things play into effect. Uh, leaves also provide hiding areas for the shrimp. So, Leaves in general are a really, really good way um, to provide shrimp with a, a natural habitat. The next thing, the last thing. So the third thing that is a key to success for breeding shrimp is driftwood. Driftwood, driftwood, driftwood. And personally, we use Malaysian driftwood just because it sinks. It's awesome. It's pretty cheap. Um, we have access to it. So Malaysian driftwood is what we found is the best. Um, you can use Mapani wood, you can use a bunch of other ones, spider wood, different things like that. And so what wood does is again, it leaches tannins. So we've talked about that with the leaves and that creates like just, excuse me, a healthy environment for the shrimp. Um, the other best thing about driftwood, well, it provides hiding areas too. So don't forget that. But the absolute best thing about driftwood is algae. So when we have an aquarium and we only have, you know, one or two, we don't want algae in our aquarium because it's our display tank. We want to be able to look at the shrimp and enjoy the shrimp. And so driftwood is in the center of the tank or it's stacked in the back of the tank. You're not going to get in there and scrub driftwood to get the algae off. You're just not going to do it, right? It's just not feasible. It's, it's, you're not going to pull the driftwood out and scrub it and put it back in there. So you're going to let the algae grow. You're going to let the microorganisms live on it. And so shrimp, use driftwood as a great source for natural food in an aquarium and so they're constantly picking on it and it's a good place where algae can grow and you're not going to get too annoyed with it and so that's another reason we highly recommend using driftwood so 
The three keys to success, Java Moss, Leaf Matter, Indian Anomaly specifically, and Driftwood, specifically Malaysian Driftwood, are the ones that we highly recommend. And so that's really, really good. Um, let's see, somebody, Mr. Science Geek, I, I got to stop because it, it caught my eye. He said, can you please get him to explain what water parameters are best for Taiwan bees? That was the one type he did not go over at the beginning. Thank you in advance. Yeah, so I'll backtrack for one second, and we can touch more on this at the end of the presentation. Uh, but Taiwan bees prefer really soft water. So usually a TDS of about um, 100 is usually pretty good. A GH of 3 to 4, a KH of 0. Um, you know, they really like soft water. Uh, you have to have a buffered substrate like Brightwell or Contra Soil, or the best is ADA Aqua Soil, you know, uh, Amazonia, uh, Malaya, Africana, those type of uh, substrates. And that will really get your pH to like 5.5 or 6 or somewhere like real low. Like usually anything below 6.5 um, to 5 is good for Taiwan bees. And they usually breed pretty well in those. And so softer the water, the better for Taiwan bees. So that hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, if mods, if you guys can take down some questions for me, I would highly appreciate that uh, towards the end. But anyway, moving on. So the next thing we have to talk about is maintenance and actually caring for shrimp. You know, what goes into, you know, water changes or uh, cycling a tank, things like that. Things that you, you have to know. So more or less the basics of keeping shrimp. And so the first thing is cycling. You know, what is the best method for cycling a shrimp tank? You know, what works, what doesn't work? Um, the absolute best way that we found is seeding a tank. Um, seeding a tank is, is the most effective. It works really well. Um, it, it allows you to add shrimp immediately. And so basically what seeding is, it's when you use a sponge filter or you use a hang on the back filter or something like that, and you run it on an existing tank. So like a tank that's heavily stocked, um, you just put it in there. And you run it for a month, maybe two months, and all that good bacteria will start to form on um, the sponge filter or the the media inside of a hang on the back filter. And so this seeding, you literally take the filter that you've been seeding for one or two months and you put it on a brand new tank and instantly you can add shrimp to that tank. And so that is by far the best way to do it. Um, another method that we use is we actually, if we don't have extra sponge filters or we don't even use sponge filters anymore, we'll take a matten filter and like squeeze out the gunk out of the matten filter. And then we'll dump that gunk into a new tank, let it run for a day, let the gunk settle, and then we'll add shrimp in. Um, we also use a product which I actually have somewhere. Oh, hopefully I don't pull any cords out. Um, we use a product called, let me see. There we go. It's called Fluval Cycle. Now it's written backwards. But this product is, uh, this is what I use in like most of our aquariums because what it comes down to is we really don't have the time to see tanks, um, especially when we're getting import orders in of, you know, 10,000, 15,000 shrimp. Um, we really don't have the time to cycle all those tanks. We don't have the manpower. And so what we do is use a product like Fluval Cycle and we dose it into our aquarium and, and that has live bacteria in it. And so we'll dose that for like the first week of having shrimp, maybe even the second week if we're having problems. And that gets the cycle going and eats up the ammonia, eats up the nitrate, eats up the nitrate. And uh, it's just really, really good. Uh, and so when we use that product, we add shrimp the day after starting. And like I said, we do it for a week. And then in the second week, we'll, we'll add it a little bit if we feel like it needs it. Um, but usually the tanks pick up pretty quickly. Um, another great way to cycle a tank is go to your pet store, buy a couple of feeder goldfish. They're dirty. They produce a ton of ammonia toss them in a tank. They're used to living in high ammonia. And so they're not going to die through the cycle, or at least they shouldn't, you know, they, they, they could, um, but they shouldn't and put like three or four of them in a tank, let them live in there for a month, feed them really good. And over the course of, you know, two, three months, that tank is going to be cycled. Uh, before you add shrimp to it, do a 95% water change, get as much water out as you can, put brand new water in and you are good to go. So those are my methods for cycling tank. There are plenty more methods out there, but that's what I use. My jaw's starting to hurt from talking so much. <laughs> that's crazy. All right, so the next thing is water changes. You know, uh, water changes seem to be the number one reason why beginners kill their shrimp, uh, why they make mistakes. And it, and it all comes down to people saying um, shrimp, you know, uh, 
need water changes like fish, you know, 50% water change or 20% water change once a week, like crazy amounts of water changes. Get this one. If you could get one thing in your head, this is what I want you to really understand is shrimp do not produce much waste. They really, really don't. They're, they're tiny and uh, they often don't even produce enough waste to keep a cycle going, which we can get to that later. Actually, we can just talk about that now. So shrimp do not produce very much waste. Usually when you buy shrimp, um, you, you get 10 of them in, you put them in a tank, you did a hundred percent water change on the tank before you got them over the course of the next two weeks, they're really not producing ammonia. The good bacteria dies. It dies off shrimp, poop, 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 poop. The ammonia builds up, kills all the shrimp because there wasn't a cycle. And so that's where we start using snails like rabbit snails and Malaysian trumpet snails, ram's horn snails to keep the cycle going. And so understand shrimp do not produce much waste. So if you're not producing much waste, what's one thing you don't need? Water changes. You really don't need that many water changes. And so I personally do about a 15% water change once a month. So it's very, very minimal. Some people breed shrimp and they literally do no water changes. Like they'll go four or five months without doing them. Um, for example, I have a cherry shrimp tank, 75 gallon cherry shrimp tank. I literally did not do a water change on it for six months. And they were breeding and doing excellent. It was right in the window, algae everywhere. And uh, they just did fine. So shrimp do not need water changes, at least not very often. And so 10% once a month is usually more than efficient. But you have to make sure of one thing. Do not go overboard on feeding because leftover food will kill shrimp tanks. It really will. And so when you do a water change, what do you do? First of all, you need to do what's called topping off a shrimp tank. As evaporation goes down, you need to add pure distilled water or pure RODI water or just RO water, something with a TDS of zero just to replenish the water. You don't need to replenish the minerals because those don't evaporate. Um, but when you do do a water change, do it slowly. Um, one method that we used to use, we would, you know, if we had a 40 gallon tank, we would drain two or three gallons out. Um, and then we would fill a bucket up with two or three gallons. We'd set it on the rim of the tank, like where the two corners come together. We'd set it up there. We'd take an airline tube and knot it, like so it's barely dripping in there. And maybe do like an, a gallon an hour, like just ridiculously slow. Because if you're running sponge filters and matten filters, they really don't need, um, you know, high water levels. They'll just keep running. And so just drip it in or run it in with an airline tube, like just nice and slow. Um, never rush a water change because shrimp cannot handle drastic changes in temperature. If you're not having your water the exact same temperature, like let's say it's five degrees off and you do a big water change, you're going to wipe out a shrimp colony, or at least you're going to stress them out and lose some. And so just easy on the water changes. And if you do that, you're really going to start seeing a huge impact in how the shrimp are doing. And so the, the next topic is feeding. You know, what is the best food for feeding shrimp? How often? You know, what do you do as far as feeding shrimp? And so new tanks need fed more often. You know, a brand new tank with not a lot of algae, um, not very many natural food sources. You want to feed them, you know, two, three times a day if you can in very, very, very small amounts. Um, just feed them little bits. Um, the other thing, when you, when you have an established tank, you're, you're most likely having driftwood in there. Um, Java moss, Malaysian drift, or Indian almond leaves, things like that, that are providing natural food sources for them. And so, honestly, you don't even need to feed them every day. You know, you know, feed them one day here, another day, or skip a couple days. You know, go on vacation. It's not not a big deal. So, natural food sources are a great way. But if you're actually feeding your shrimp, you know, what types of food do you feed them? Um, one thing we recommend is powdered food. So, like one of our best, best, best products. Um, number one foods is Bacter AE by Glass Garden. Uh, we do sell it on our website, so you guys could check it out there. We're running very low on it though, so we need to get another order in, which hopefully will be in soon. Um, so Bacter AE is by far one of the best. It, it's little ground up microorganisms, bacteria, biofilm, all these good things you you literally sprinkle on top of the water. Um, I have many videos on Bacter AE, you know, um, how to feed it, all that kind of stuff. And if I if you guys can't find it, I'll I'll help you. Uh, just send me an email, rob at flipaquatics.com, and I'll, I'll lead you in the right direction. And so with the powdered food, it literally spreads throughout the whole tank. It's like it's snowing. Um, baby shrimp can find it easily. They don't have to compete with adults. Um, you know, baby shrimp, when they're first born, they really don't move around much. And so putting food exactly where they're at is where you're going to really increase your baby survival rates. 
And so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is vegetables, spinach, you know, carrots, um, dandelions. A lot of people feed dandelions. And how you feed these things, I, I learned this recently, is if like cucumbers, like cucumbers don't sink, right? They float. Um, a, lot of, a lot of vegetables float. So what you can do is freeze the food, and that breaks down the cell walls, which saturate the food in water. And so when you go to feed it after it thaws, things sink instantly. So freezing any type of vegetable will get to the sink instantly. So that's, that's something really cool to know that I picked up on recently. Um, another type of food is your specialty shrimp foods. One thing I do not want you guys to do is fall into the marketing scheme behind specialty shrimp foods. Um, it seems like when I first got into the shrimp hobby, every two months there was like a new best shrimp food. Like this is the one that's going to change the shrimp hobby. Like constantly everyone's coming out with a new type of shrimp food. And specialty shrimp food, you literally buy this kind and buy that kind and I'll try this. And next thing you know, you have so much shrimp food. And so the only shrimp food that I 100% stand behind is Bacter AE. Um, the another, other one that I feed all my shrimp is a, a product called Shrimp King. And uh, I use complete mineral and protein. I, I think I have some down here. Yeah, yeah, right here. And so Shrimp King Complete. Let me see. Let me get that on camera. Again, it's backwards. So you guys aren't going to be able to see it. Shrimp King Complete is one of my favorite foods. Um, the things I like about it is when you feed it, when you put it in the water, it instantly like starts flaking apart. The shrimp can grab a piece, run away with it. There's no competition for food. Um, it's, you know, it's very, very great as far as, um, what, as far as, uh, quality of food. Um, you know, they, they really are awesome about their food. So I highly recommend shrimp King foods. Again, we have them on our, on our website, at least the ones that I use. Um, I am experimenting, um, recently when I did an order, he sent me a bunch of other types of food, uh, that are, are shrimp King products that I'm trying out. Um, I really, I haven't yet. I'm going to. And if I really like those, then I might start offering other ones. But right now, the ones that I highly recommend are Shrimp King Complete, Shrimp King Mineral, and Shrimp King Protein. Um, the mineral just gives them extra minerals. The protein uh, gives the females a little bit better uh, chance of uh, producing eggs and recovering from eggs. So like when you start seeing females with eggs dying, it's probably because she had a protein deficiency after having the eggs and uh, just died off. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why shrimp die, but that could be something that could be causing it. So just know that. Um, the other type of food is leaf matter. And so again, going back to Indian almond leaves, breaking down microorganisms, uh, leaf matter is just a great way to have in your tank or a great thing to have in your tank. Indian almond leaves usually run between 50 cents to a dollar a piece. Um, so they're not crazy expensive. If you don't have a budget for it, you know, go out in your yard and pick up some oak leaves or, or try some other leaves, you know, any type of fruit leaf like apple trees, you know, things like that do really well in shrimp tanks. And so, uh, so definitely try out some leaf matter. I, you're not going to regret it. I promise. Uh, the last thing is biofilm. Biofilm is by far the best shrimp food you can have. Um, the only thing is getting it to grow. So biofilm for me, like to, to explain to you guys what it is. If you ever put a new piece of driftwood in your tank with no fish, no shrimp, no nothing, and it starts to fungus, it has like white cloudy fungus on it. That's biofilm. Hello. <laughs> and so usually shrimp eat biofilm so fast that you never even see it. Um, but if you can get some biofilm growing, you're really going to do your shrimp some justice. And so, um, yeah, so that's as far as feeding and what types of food I recommend and different things like that. Now, moving on, there's, there's two things you do not want in your shrimp tank. Two things. The first thing is a parasite it's not really a parasite it's just like a parasitic insect or whatever it's just an insect that's not good for your shrimp tanks it's called hydra it is a little stinker it's like this little tube type thing that has tentacles and they grab your shrimp see i'm looking at myself on camera so that's why i keep looking over because right here i got like my presentation and the comments and all that kind of stuff but hydra is um it's a type of, I don't even know what it is, if it's an insect or what, but it comes from the jellyfish family and has these little tentacles that literally uh, reach out. And when a baby shrimp goes by, it captures them and it eats them. Or if an adult shrimp goes by, it will sting it or grab it. And, you know, you, adult shrimp can get bacterial infections from them. Uh, the other thing is planaria. Uh, planaria are like the little worms. They got triangular heads. Um, they got a little mouth in the center of their body. And they're like little leeches almost. 
Um, the way to tell if it's planaria versus like detritus worms or something like that is the triangular hat. Always look for the triangle. Um, so these are two things that you do not want in your shrimp tank because it will cause bacterial infections. It will kill baby shrimp. Um, you know, they're just vicious, vicious little creatures. So if you do have them, how do you get rid of them? Um, I use a product called Fenbendazole. Um, it's a, you can get it as a dewormer. Um, uh, Panicure C on Amazon, uh, one gram packs. Uh, usually for three one gram packs, it runs about $10 for Panicure C. Um, it's, a, it's just a great product. You literally dose 0.1 gram per 10 gallons of water. Just I just literally sprinkle it on top of the water. I let it be in the tank for about two, three days, and it will kill off all the parasites for sure. Uh, it just decimates them. And so that I highly recommend. After using it, after using it once, wait about two, three days. Do a water change on your tank. Um, not because the Panicure C or the Fenbendazole is toxic, just because usually killing off all those parasites or the um, planaria or hydra usually causes a little bit of ammonia spike. And so you want to do a water change just to get that ammonia out of the water. Uh, so that's a, a, something I really recommend. And so I want to move on to, so that's like your basics for shrimp, like pretty much everything you need to know in a summarized form. And so I'm sure we'll have some more questions as far as that goes, but moving on. So um, a few things to watch out for when buying shrimp, like what should you look for? You know, how do you know if it's a good seller versus bad seller? And so the first thing when you're buying shrimp that you want to watch out for is importers. Um, now, granted, I import shrimp. Um, I, I resell imported shrimp. I'm very transparent uh, with which shrimp are imported versus which shrimp are USA bred. And, you know, I really go into quarantine. So that's like, that's good. Um, but there are some importers out there that do not do quarantine whatsoever. They literally import the shrimp. They usually do pre-sales. Um, to sell as many shrimp as they can. As soon as that shrimp lands, they do a water change on it and send it back out to you. So the whole turnaround's like the shrimp's in shipping for four days. It gets to somewhere, it gets a water change and it's in shipping for three days and it gets to your door. You keep it for two weeks and it dies. Like that's why importers are killing the hobby. Um, so there are good importers out there. Like, don't get me wrong that take the time to quarantine the shrimp and let them settle into their environment. Let them sit there for three, three, four weeks. Um, let them adjust. And so those are good importers. Uh, a lot of importers don't even check for parasites. Uh, they send on parasites. They send out the green fungus. Now, granted, sometimes it gets through. Like I've had uh, one case where a green parasite got through and it must have been in like the infancy uh, stage and I just didn't see it. But a lot, like I bought imported shrimp that come in with like all these crazy parasites. You know, obviously they're sick and the person just shipped them anyway and I had to pay for them and I eat the cost of them. And so it's just never good. Importers are tough. Um, so here's what I recommend. When dealing with importers, I highly, highly recommend you to go to them and be like, hey, um, I want to order shrimp. When are you getting your next shipment in? And they'll say, okay, I'm getting my next shipment in uh, February 3rd. And you're like, okay, great. I want to order this many shrimp. Um, you're getting that order in on February 3rd. How soon can you ship my shrimp to me? And if they say, oh, I can ship them out to you February 5th, or February 6th, you know that person isn't doing quarantine on these shrimp. You know they're just trying to get that money back as quick as possible. And so I highly recommend not going with those people. Um, you know, someone that cares about shrimp is at the bare minimum, bare minimum going to do a week or two of quarantine just because shrimp are so sensitive and they need to adjust to their parameters before sending them off. And so at least give them a week or two. And that's how you know you, you're working with an importer that at least cares about the shrimp. And so that is definitely one thing to watch out for. Um, the other thing to watch out for is shrimp that you buy. You know, you might not only, someone might say they're USA bred, but they might not be. And so you always want to watch out for two parasites, um, one of which is Vorticilla and the other one is Scutarilia, uh, which are these little parasites that attach. Like if this was the rostrum of the shrimp, right? Uh, the, the nose section. Um, they're little parasites that literally attach to the head of the shrimp. Um, now, they, they won't kill the shrimp, right? They won't kill it. The only time they can kill it is if it's such a bad infection or so many of the Vorticilla or Scutarilla, it will like suffocate the shrimp. Like they won't be able to eat because there's nowhere to shove food in their mouth because there's so many of those parasites. And so these ones are really bad. And you really see these a lot in imported shrimp. And what happens is most of the time imported shrimp will come in and they won't have any, but they'll have like all these little white dots on their gill. And those are the eggs of the Scutarilla and the Vorticilla. 
And so basically what you do is look at the shrimp, see if there's anything in the rostrum or see if there's any white speckles in their gills. And they're usually laid in like little patches of, you know, 10 or 20 eggs, uh, something like that. So definitely be on the lookout for those. Uh, an easy way to treat them is aquarium salt. You know, you pull the shrimp out or as soon as you get them in, put them in a bucket, put them in a quarantine tank and every like couple days, treat them with aquarium salt. Um, you know, a cup of, or what is it? Five cups of water for a tablespoon of aquarium salt is usually a pretty good formula for getting rid of it. Uh, the other thing you could use is fenbendazole, which I, this is what I use. Uh, which again is the dog dewormer. I dose it straight to the tank and as the, the eggs hatch, it kills them. And so, uh, so you really don't see spread of vorticilla or scotorilla if you're dosing the fenbendazole, but it can be somewhat harsh on shrimp if you use it for long periods of time. And so the aquarium salt is probably a better option if you have that much time to devote to it. Um, and usually the eggs hatch when the shrimp is uh, molting. And so the eggs will hatch. So this is my theory, and this is kind of what I've seen. Um, so shrimp hatch, right? Our shrimp molt, the molt comes off, the eggs and the gills hatch, and then while shrimp come over and pick at um, the, the molt because they eat their own molts, that's when the eggs come up, they reattach the gill, they come back up, they attach the head, and then they release eggs as they're attached to the head, and then the shrimp really breathes in the eggs, and that's where it gets stuck in their gill. That's just my philosophy on it, my view on it. I don't know if that's correct, um, but it's what I believe. And and I, like I don't know, there might be better research out there that says otherwise. So I need to do some more research as far as that goes. But those those are those two parasites. Um, again, fenbendazole will definitely take care of them. The last thing to really watch out for when buying shrimp is a disease or a parasite called Elobiopsidea. It's the green fungus. Um, it attaches to the underbelly of the shrimp. If you're not looking at it carefully, it will almost look like the shrimp is buried. And so definitely be looking out for that. Um, really, it's a nasty disease that there is no cure for it. I mean, there's some people that said they've cured it and they might have like, but it could have been a fluke. Like there's no definitive, like this is a product that kills Elobiopsidea. Uh, there isn't that yet. And hopefully there will be, but Elobiopsidea comes from uh, usually neocaridina is being bred in Taiwan in ponds. Um, you know, it's just a pretty brutal disease. There's really no way to cure it, like I said. So if you find a shrimp with this green fungus looking thing under their underbelly, get them out of the tank as quick as possible. Um, don't even, you know, I would just euthanize them, you know, kill them off as quick as you can because they are going to die. They're going to suffer. Uh, it's better just to have a quick death and get them out of your tank because once your shrimp dies, this stuff spreads. And so you really need to be on top of it. So this is one thing that when we do our quarantine, we really are looking for um, not only vorticilla and elobiopsidea, or vorticilla and scutarilla, but we're looking for elobiopsidea. And that is one where we never want to get through. And uh, so far, we've gotten one case of it. And we're not 100% sure if it was our shrimp. Um, the guy said he bought a couple sources of shrimp, and, and it was in the shrimp. Um, so, But it could have been ours. And so we're, we take blame for it. And uh, so far, so good. That was the only report of it. But elobiopsidea is a, a vicious disease. And so the last thing, and then we'll go into some questions. Um, the last thing you want to watch out for on shrimp is a thing called a bacterial infection. Uh, the shrimp actually turns like a complete white color, like cloud. Um, they like they get it like a cloudy color. Like every part of their body is a, is like white. And that's a bacterial infection. Um, it either means like there's some parasites in your tank that are biting the shrimp, like uh, planaria or hydra, uh, or you just have really bad water quality, something like that. Like there's something in your tank that is causing them to get a bacterial infection. And when they die, like when a shrimp dies from a bacterial infection, uh, it, uh, the other shrimp will start eating it. And that's when it really spreads quickly. So you need, like whenever you see a shrimp that has a bacterial infection, like that cloudy color, pull them out, separate them, um, put them in their own specimen container or something like that. And you will, you will be happy you did that. Do a water change on your tank because obviously something's going wrong in there. Um, check for parasites, things like that. Oftentimes, people get bacterial infections and muscle necrosis confused. Um, muscle necrosis is where the inside of the shrimp is a solid white color, but the outside um, isn't. So it's still clear, like the legs are still clear, the abdomen area is still clear. It's just their tail, like the inside of their tail gets a cloudy color, uh, which muscle necrosis is pretty much just a protein buildup on the cells. It usually happens in older shrimp 
or shrimp that have bad genetics. So it's not really contagious. Like if the shrimp dies and other shrimp eat it, they're not going to get muscle necrosis. But what could happen is if you have a male shrimp that has muscle necrosis and it breeds with all your females, then the baby shrimp are going to be more likely to get muscle necrosis later in their lives. And so again, it's an, it's something that's good to call for, um, but it's definitely not bad. And so, uh, so muscle, muscle necrosis is something that it's, you can leave it or you can take it out. It really doesn't matter. But bacterial infection, you definitely want to treat for. Um, we actually use hydrogen peroxide to treat for ours. We'll pull the shrimp out, put them in a catch cup, give a, you know, a little squeeze of hydrogen peroxide, leave them in there for 10 minutes, put them back in the tank or put them into a quarantine tank. And uh, usually they'll recover from it. Um, but again, there's probably something wrong with your tank if you're getting bacterial infections. And so that is the basics to breeding Neocaridina shrimp. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that little like presentation. Um, but I really appreciate you guys being here and we're going to do uh, some questions. So I'm more than fine with answering as many questions as you guys have and, and really diving into it. And so uh, I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot. We got about, we only have, we might go a little bit longer. I know Corey from Aquarium Co-op stream starts at eight. Um, but if you guys have some good questions, I don't want to leave them out. I know we only have 10 minutes. Um, so we might go a little bit into Corey stream and uh, that way everyone can ask their questions. So um, if any of the mods wrote down questions, if you guys could link those right now, I would be very appreciative of that. Let me crush this bottle real quick here. I'll move my mic for a second. All right. So uh, let's see what we got. I'll scroll back up through and find some. Uh, Dank Tank says, what days do you ship for orders to New York? Uh, we usually only ship on Mondays. Sometimes we ship on Tuesdays. Uh, we're slowly growing. Uh, what days we ship and what days we don't ship just because we're getting more orders in now. Um, but yeah, so we usually ship only on Mondays and Tuesday mornings and we usually try to get them out pretty quick. Uh, D from Brooklyn said, I wonder if saltwater shrimp have these diseases that that would be interesting. I know I've seen some salt saltwater shrimp with a, a thing that looks like Ella biopsidae, but I'm really not sure what it was. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely something. Uh, Rax, Raxillion says, can you recommend a good cocktail sauce? <laughs> no, I can't, but that good question for sure. Um, that's funny. Uh, Majid, Majid, uh, Mazak or Raza, Majid Raza said, uh, Robert, what's the best way to collect shrimp? Um, a good way to collect a lot of shrimp is you put a piece of food in a net, let all the shrimp conjugate to the net to eat the food and then net them all out. Other than that, you just catch them one by one by one, which is, it takes some time. Um, uh, Joshua July said, always amazing live stream. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Joshua. Appreciate the love. Uh, you guys are awesome as well. Um, uh, Raxillion said, this is so awesome. Wanted to learn this and it is live. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we got Kang Lee, um, really, really great guy supporting us tossing some links in there if you guys are if you guys were interested in products he was throwing some links out in there um the platy pen said that's great advice about freezing the vegetables yeah so when you freeze vegetables it breaks down the cell walls of the vegetables and you they instantly sink so you freeze them you take them out you let them thaw and then you feed them and it usually works really good you could put them in there cold but you know the shrimp might freak out with it and so they will uh sink so yeah so that's definitely something that's really really good that i learned uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, would you use uh, Kelsey Noss? Kelsey, thank you for being here. Would you use a TDS meter to help determine shrimp water changes? Yeah. So the way you use a TDS meter to determine water changes is like if you if you're doing your top offs, um, if you're doing everything right, and let's say you set up your tank and it's at 200 TDS, and you're topping off with pure RO water, pure distilled water, and your TDS is like 225. That means something is getting into your water, like whether it's ammonia or nitrates or nitrates. Um, there's a buildup of heavy metals or toxins in your water. And so you want to do a water change and get that number back down to 200. Again, that only applies if you're doing top offs. If you're not doing top offs, your TDS is always going to go up because the minerals aren't evaporating. Um, great question, Kelsey. Really good question. Arash Sharita said, Mods, please get Rob to answer my question. Is shrimp can complete a good staple diet? How many sticks per how many sticks per adult and how often? Shrimp king color, too much protein, 50%, and does it work? So first of all, 
Arash, thank you. Great question. Um, your first question is, Shrimp King Complete, is it a good staple diet? Yes. 100%. That's what I use for all of my tanks. Um, it's a really, really good food. It's extremely easy to break, so you can feed it in small portions. Um, it is an awesome, awesome food. It's one food that I would highly recommend um, if you were just wanted to feed one food. You said, how many sticks per adult shrimp and how often? Um, I would say an average stick is about a quarter of an inch, and I feed about one-third of a stick per 10 shrimp. So it's not very much. Um, you can feed a couple times a day. Uh, you also ask, Shrimp King Color, too much protein, 50%, and does it work? So I personally do not feed color-enhancing foods uh, for the reason that I don't want to do false advertisement. Uh, I don't want to make a shrimp look great and then send it to someone, and the shrimp after three months looks terrible. And so does it work? Yes, I'm sure it does because they wouldn't sell it if it didn't work. 50% um, protein is a little much. Um, no, because you're not going to be feeding it too often. Like you'll probably feed it once or twice a week. Um, so a little extra protein will never hurt them. And so, yeah, so that those are really, really good questions. So thank you for asking them. Um, let's see. I know we're starting to get some more questions from some of the mods in the bottom. Uh, let's scroll up. I want to get to the first one. Uh, D from Brooklyn said RO water versus treated tap water. Um, so here's the deal with tap water. Uh, tap water, this, the water plant that you're getting it from doesn't always tell you what they're treating for. Um, they might be putting chemicals in the water that aren't toxic to humans, but could be extremely toxic to fish. Uh, there might be a bacteria in the water that they don't know about that's toxic to fish and shrimp. And so treated tap water, usually most of the time will be completely fine, uh, depending on when you live or where you live. But it, you also in the risk of something slipping through the tap water and killing your tank. And so for me, it's risk first reward. Um, I could pay a little bit extra for RO water and remineralizer, but I eliminate the chance of something getting through and killing all my shrimp. And so that's why I always choose RO water, um, just because I'm, I know that I can get the perfect parameters and I can do it without risking the lives of the shrimp. Um, Thomas Kraft, thank you for being here, Thomas. Thomas is also a really, really great guy um, that I really value him as a friend and he's been a big supporter of mine. And so Thomas, thank you for being here. Um, but he said, my cherry shrimp from you are breeding like crazy. Should I be worried about overpopulation? That is great news, Thomas. So thank you for sharing. Um, he said, I have a canister filter and thri thriving moss in a 10-gallon. Um, yeah, so what I would recommend is if someone was worried about overpopulation, a good way to keep your shrimp population in check is um, if you have multiple tanks, you can literally... Every time your shrimp give birth, move your adult shrimp to a new tank and then let those babies grow up, sell all the babies. And by that time, the shrimp should have bred again in their new tank and you can take them out and move them back and forth. So you can have two tanks that are set up with identical parameters and you can continuously move shrimp, the adult shrimp back and forth and then sell the babies as they get older. And that also helps the babies grow a lot faster. Uh, J-A-W-B Tetra Tank says, do you like Mongolian leaves? or magnolia leaves. Um, yeah, honestly, I've never used them. Um, Dwayne, uh, if Dwayne's in the house, Dwayne Kitchell, he actually sent me a bunch of them for free. And so he really hooked me up. So I'm definitely going to start using them. I just haven't yet. So I'll give you my feedback on those in the coming weeks um, as I experiment with them and as I use them. And uh, real quick, shout out to everyone in the house. There's like close to 200 people here. It'd be really cool to hit over 200. Um, but thank you guys all for being here. I hope you really enjoyed uh, the presentation on how to breed shrimp and, and answering some questions. And like I said, we're going to probably spend the next 10, 15 minutes answering more questions. And so if you guys have specific uh, shrimp questions that want answered, please drop them in the comments. And if I don't get to them, I'll probably incorporate them into a, a video. So please feel free to ask. Um, it's always better to ask and, and then not ask. Uh, Mackenzie Ferguson said, how would you suggest acclimating newly bought shrimp to your tank? Drip acclimation? That is an absolute amazing question that I did not touch on, but I should have. Um, so how you acclimate new shrimp, it depends on a few factors. This is how I do it. Um, if I got shrimp in a breather bag or, um, you know, what are they? Cordon breather bags or lifelong breather bags. If you get them in breather bags, I always drip acclimate them because you know that there is an ammonia buildup because there's an equal exchange of oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. And so with 
regular breather bags, I will leave them. I'll either float them in the tank by putting a tubware container in there and setting them in the tubware container. That way the tubware container gets to the tank temperature, which brings the bag to the tank temperature because you can't float breather bags. Um, it depletes the oxygen and suffocates the shrimp. And so with breather bags, I put them in a, after they're, they're temperature acclimated, I put them in a cup. I drip acclimate them usually over the course of a couple hours. Um, if I get them in a regular bag, so like, you know, with air in it and it's not a breather bag, um, I usually temperature acclimate them. And then as soon as I cut the bag open, I'll dump them into a net and put them in the tank because with, um, without using breather bags, you run the risk of ammonia spikes in the tank and a suit or in the bag. As soon as you cut the bag open, uh, the ammonia will become toxic because the pH will shoot up because of the oxygen coming into the bag. And that's a whole nother video, but we'll get into that in another video. But anyway, um, I've killed many shrimp due to ammonia spikes as soon as getting them in. So I've learned if they come in a regular bag, I just cut the top of the bag after the temp track made and throw them in the tank. Uh, but Mackenzie, another really, really good question. Uh, Kyle Laferty said, any idea why my female blue velvet shrimp would be dropping her eggs? Uh, this happened the second time I've noticed for her. Uh, the parameters in your tank are off. Uh, so either the parameters are off and she's not liking the parameters, but she's breeding so the parameters shouldn't be too far off. Or maybe it's because, you know, you don't have enough hiding places for her. She's stressed out. Uh, maybe you have too many males in the tank. Um, so I would try first um, limiting the amount of light that you have on. Maybe you're keeping your light on for 12 hours a day and it's just causing extra stress. So give her some more hiding places and hopefully she'll hold her eggs. If she's not holding her eggs, then I would start worrying about adjusting certain parameters in the water. Uh, King Lee said, um, oh, King Lee, I actually got that one. That was a great question. Thank you for reposting that. That was from a rash about the Shrimp King food. Um, let's see. Ezekiel Leela, or Leo said, I have a question. I want to buy these Neos from this one breeder, but he keeps his shrimp at a TDS of around 120. My TDS is at 250. So will that be an issue? Should I expect any deaths? Um, Ezekiel, the first thing I recommend is, uh, first of all, TDS doesn't mean anything. Like TDS is a bad measurement when you're just going like, hey, they have a TDS of this, I have a TDS of this. Um, what you need to know is what creates that TDS. So like, is that like, I could, I could have a can of Coke that has a TDS of 200, but that doesn't mean my shrimp would thrive in a can of Coke. And so you really have to figure out what is going on with the TDS. And so I would test his GH and his KH. Uh, so his carbonate hardness and his general hardness. And if your general hardness and carbonate hardness are pretty close, then you're not going to have any deaths whatsoever, even though your TDSs are so far off. Um, and also, it's easier go, to go from low TDS to high TDS than it is to go from high TDS to low TDS. So I would say, um, depending on what your TDS is made of and what his TDS is made of, um, you are going to be completely fine by getting neocaridina from him. That's what I would say. Uh, D from Brooklyn said, hey, Dank, let's group buy, question mark. Yeah, if you guys want to do a group buy, that'll save you on shipping for sure. Uh, it's always better to buy in groups. Uh, Matt said, do you breed Caridina generally? Uh, let's see. Let, let me Google and see exactly what those are. Oh, no. So, okay. So those are the Sulawesi Cardinal Shrimp. Um, I currently do not breed them, although I'm working on getting into it. Uh, with this new room, I'll have the space to be able to do it. And at that time, I'll, I'll give you some more feedback as far as how to breed them. I'll make all the mistakes so that you don't have to. Um, so that's the way we'll handle that. But um, yeah, so I don't have any tips yet. I um, <laughs> uh, need more shrimp, get busy. Oh, so somebody just said they checked my website. Nothing is in stock. Need more shrimp, get busy. Um, so we are running a little bit low on stock, although there should be a decent amount of shrimp still in stock. I know we have blue velvets. Uh, we have carbon rillies. We should have red rillies. Um, we have orange sakuras. Um, we have some crystal black, some snow, uh, snow whites. Like we still have some shrimp, but we're waiting for the next import to come in. That should be coming in in the next two weeks, which means the shrimp should be available um, towards the end of summer. Uh, Mooney1029 said, are you going to have any black rose anytime soon? Uh, so yeah, the black neo caridina. Again, we're getting a huge shipment of them in in the next two or three weeks. And so they'll be available within a month and a half, I'm guessing. And uh, yeah, so those are one that sold really, really well for us. And so we're definitely going to get them back. Um, yeah, so very, very cool. 
Um, D from Brooklyn said, how's the wife's tank doing? Uh, the wife's tank back here is a Taiwan B tank, and uh, it's been doing really, really well. It has about two inches of evaporation right now, which isn't good, but it also has a ton of algae in there, which is really good for the shrimp. It has a huge plant load, and so it's been doing really, really well. And so, uh, so yeah, for sure. Uh, Valley Fish says, you ever use the glass shrimp net? Yes, I actually have one. I will be doing a video on the glass shrimp net here in the near future. And, uh, and that is an awesome product that I do recommend. Uh, the only thing is don't drop it because it will break. Uh, Neon Tetra Aquarius says, will you do a contest for newbies like me to win some nice shrimp? Yeah, so you got to join the, the contest we're doing right now, which is a shrimp breeding contest. And uh, we could have a, a, the following year, we'll have a newbie award for the, the person that is newest and just entered and did the best. Uh, Dwayne, Quitchell, D Dwayne Kitchell said, Rob, can you spend a second talking about how a shrimp behaves before they die? Like swimming in tight circles or such? Um, it depends on what the shrimp dies from. So like usually, generally, um, if a shrimp's going to die, it usually likes being by itself. So it will go hide and it will just stay still. Like it won't swim its, fan its swimmerettes very much. It will just kind of be still. Um, most of the time, shrimp die before they molt or during molting. And so if that happens, you'll usually see them like um, flicking around the tank really fast or like moving around awkwardly. Or maybe they're flipped over on their side, but they're still moving. Um, so that's usually a failed molt. And that's uh, one way they die. But as far as behaviors, I'm really not, other than those, I'm really not sure of too, too many. Um, but that's a very, very good question. Um, yeah, Kyle, I did I did answer your question about why your shrimp are dropping her eggs. Um, this is DVR, so you can scroll back and, and get that. It's probably about 10 minutes ago. Um, but most of the time they drop their eggs either because the parameters are off or they're stressed. So I just said add some hiding places and you'll be good to go. And then if that doesn't work, we can we can talk about changing some parameters. Um, but let's answer some more, just some quick questions. I know it's a little after eight. Um, so we, we want to wrap up here in the next five, 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to answer some more questions. Uh, catfish cave asked assassin snails in a neocaridina tank. Assassin snails will eat shrimp. They definitely will. Um, most of the time they won't, but they definitely can. And so it's risk versus reward. Um, you know, are you okay with having a couple shrimp get eaten by assassin snails? If so, then use them. Um, if you don't want to lose any shrimp, then don't use assassin snails. Um, a lot of people are saying thanks for the, sh the stream. You guys are so welcome. I appreciate you guys being there. Uh, Brits, Brits Aquatic says, any fish you suggest to keep with shrimp that don't eat baby shrimp? Does it exist? Uh, Otocinclus, um, pretty much any of the Otocinclus or Otocinclus or however you want to say it, um, they're like these little catfish that are algae eaters. They will do well in shrimp tanks. They won't eat baby shrimp. Um, they'll do really, really good. So I would suggest uh, having those. Um, pygmy quarries usually do pretty good. Herbrosis quarries are really small. They they do pretty good. Um, but most of your nanofish will eat the babies. We're experimenting with celestial pearl danios right now. And so far, they seem to be doing really well. They're not bothering the shrimp whatsoever. Um, but I'm not sure if they're going to eat the babies or not. So we'll definitely find out about that. But great question, Britt. Uh, Drew asked, um, first of all, how are you? Thank you. I'm doing really good. Voice is killing me now. My jaw is sore from talking. And smiling. So I like, I keep looking over, but I'm constantly smiling. So it makes my jaw sore. <laughs> uh, real life problems. I don't know. Uh, he, but Drew asks, hey, what tank size do I keep? Or do I need to keep a vampire shrimp with red cherries? Um, I've never kept a vampire shrimp. I believe they're filter feeders. Um, but I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if they're safe to keep with shrimp. Again, because I haven't done much research on them. Uh, but that's that's a good question. I'm sure if you did a quick Google search, it would pop up and you can find um, some people that kept them together. Um, but yeah, so let's see, moving on. Oh, that's awesome. So we did have 200 people on here at one point. So that's really cool that we broke 200 today. Uh, thank you guys again for being here. Uh, the Platy Pen said, why would the segments in the abdomen of the cherry shrimp turn a lighter shade of red than the rest of the tail as the shrimp is dying? Let me, let me read that again. The platy pen said, why would the segments in the abdomen, abdomen of the cherry shrimp turn a lighter shade of red 
when the rest of the tail of the shrimp is dying. When the shrimp is dying. Platy, I'm not sure, man. I, I can't say that it's ever happened to me. Um, possibly, maybe the shrimp molted. And when the shrimp molted, um, it kind of took off too much of the shell in the middle section and maybe didn't get enough off on the tail and the, maybe the head. And so it, it was a redder head, a redder tail, and a clear midsection. Or maybe it's a really shrimp pattern. Um, you know, there's a lot that could go into that. So I would need pictures to know for sure. But yeah, so I that's just me shooting from the hip. Um, everything animal said, are Neocaridina compatible with Endlers? Yes, uh, Endlers would be great for Neocaridina. Um, the only thing is you'd really, really, really have to uh, put a lot of moss in there and stuff like that so that the babies would survive. They shouldn't bother the adults, though. Um, Arash Sharita said, Mods, any any opinions on Hikari Shrimp Cuisine? Uh, Hikari Shrimp Cuisine, I used to use it. Um, it's really small granules. It's it's a decent food. I'm not sure of the mineral contents of it and how good it is as far as that goes. Um, but, it, I mean, if again, use what works for you. That's what I highly recommend. Use what works for you and, and keep using it because that is the best thing that you could do. Um, what else? We got... Pentley Pasco said, I might have misses, but for tangerine tigers, do they do okay in soft water? I'm in the Seattle area and our water is pretty soft out here. Tangerine tigers do best in soft water. Um, so that is a, an exception to the, the tiger rule. Uh, tangerine tigers do really, 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 really well in soft water. So yes, Seattle area, if you have soft water, tangerine tigers will do good for you. Uh, Johnny Marin said, how are your PRL doing? No specials come out anything soon? Um, yeah, so we are definitely are going to be doing specials in the near future. We're definitely going to open up um, people to get into the shrimp competition. Um, it's just been a busy week, so that's definitely something that's going to be happening over the course of this week. Um, but the PRL are doing great. Um, we're definitely going to be ordering more, and they are fantastic looking, like super high quality for how much they're going for. And so I really, really like them. And uh, again, PRL, the only difference is um, between a PRL and a crystal red is that a PRL was never mixed with like a golden or anything like that. So it's more of a pure line. And so I get that question quite a lot. Um, let's answer two more questions and then we'll call it a night. Um, Tyrone Cortez says, what tank size do you use in breeding? Uh, 20 gallon longs are by far my number one breeding tank. I really, really like it. Um, so that's what I, I recommend to everyone. Um, Mas Mestiza said, I may have missed it, but when will starter packs be restocked? Starter packs will be available, uh, starting again here this week. Um, one of the days this week, I'll get them up updated and they'll be ready to go again. Uh, we are waiting on Indian almond leaves to come back in stock. Our shipment of Indian almond leaves should be in this week. So we'll be able to ship the starter packs next week. Uh, last question. Sharon Kinney says, will Cory cats eat baby shrimp? Um, not the really, really small quarries like pygmy quarries or herbosis quarries, but pretty much all the other quarries will eat shrimp. Um, they might, they even eat adult shrimp from time to time. But yeah, so first of all, we have the shrimp competition coming up. You guys definitely check that out. Check out my video. King Lee posted in the description. I'll post it in the description. So check that out below or somewhere up here. Um, but yeah, so we got the shrimp, the shrimp contest coming up, which is going to be a lot of fun. We have some specials on the website coming up. So definitely check out flipaquatics.com. Um, I appreciate you guys being here. Hopefully you learned something and I look forward to seeing you guys again next week. But before we end my man, Ollie Taylor dropping a $10 super chat. He said, Hey man, can you shoot Ken 10 bucks to soften the blow of his tank hiccups on his birthday? I know it's not much, but we're gutted for him so yeah ollie i will definitely pass the ten dollars on to him and let him know that you said that thank you so much for dropping a super chat uh ollie i really appreciate you as soon as this live stream's over i'm going to send you a message on facebook and we, we can finish our conversation but much love to all of you thank you for being here and i hope you guys enjoy this little little talk on how to breed neocaridina shrimp you guys made a great week and i'll talk with you guys soon